Thanks again. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Said Lama. I'm the industry account manager for Solicat, uh, specialized in the civil market. So today we may have Matt Colbert from Vancouver and Jay Kwan from uh, New Brunswick, both are technical consultants for civil market as well. So a few things first, uh, we're going to be recording this. So I will make this available to review afterwards or to share with your coworkers. So it's going to be in our YouTube channel. You will have access to this series as well as a lot of other technical videos. There's a couple of nice stuff that Matt has put together too. So the easiest way is to go to our website, click on the YouTube icon at the top of the page and there you go. So this will be our second best practice series. And today we're going to be talking about industry best practices when working with corridors. So let's get into the agenda. So today we have brief intro. We're going to talk about creation techniques, surfaces, performance, split roads, and we're going to finish, we're going to be finishing up with a Q&A. Uh, by the way, we're not going to be open up for audio. There's a lot of us in this webinar, so please use the question panel in the go to uh, options on your right. And we're going to be addressing those questions along the way. Uh, some of them, we're going to be taking them at the end. So let's get let's get this started. So as many of you know, we're part of the cancel group of company. And what does this mean? It means that we can provide solutions from our partner companies, ensuring that you have all your software and hardware needs in one location. So for 25 years, we've been helping a lot of customers make things faster, increase their margins, and reduce their business risk to some of our services like training, data management, customization, workflow assessment. Those are the classic services. These are the mar market we serve. Obviously, AC, civil infrastructure, and manufacturing. We have the largest team in Canada, all time zones, both languages, even other languages. <laughs> so these are products that we work. You know, you all know we work with Autodesk, but we have all other products like Bluebeam with the review solution. For those who don't know, it's a PDF markup creation and collaboration tool specific for an industry. So this product comes very handy these days with the COVID pandemic, people doing remote meetings and, and working from home. We also have the FME solutions and CTC, which are productivity tools for Civil 3D and Revit. So before we get into Matt's agenda today, I'd like to remind everybody our upcoming events. So the third version of our series is coming next week. We're going to be talking about pipe and pressure networks. We also have a prepare a Blooming webinar specific for the civil industry. That's going to be happening May 6th. And our productivity workshop and our classic courses that you all, all know. Finally, uh, service bundles. It's uh, Right now we have a lot of demand for BIM 360. People need the access to the data, so they're looking for cloud solutions. So this is like a like a bundle where you can kickstart your, your BIM 360 portfolio. We also have several Bluebeam bundles. It will depend on how deep you want to go, but this is something that you can just deploy and start using. It's very user-friendly and we can we can help you if you need any kind of help. And finally, a seller to BIM. So this is a bunch of services that we've been running now uh, remotely, like workflow assessments, we're doing the template standard developments, automations, obviously training and civil tools and, and our technical support. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Matt. Matt, can you please uh, take ownership of this? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, OK. All right, my name is Matt Kohlberg. Been with SolidCAD for, well, pretty much ever. And so today we're going to talk about uh, some corridor best practices. It's sort of assumed that you know a little bit about corridors already. So I'm going to make that assumption. All right, let's get myself set up here. All right, let's go. Uh, I'm using Civil 3D 2020 currently. 
most everything I'm going to talk about today is is doable for almost any version of Civil 3D um, 2018 and above, because there's a specific tool that was released in 2018 that I'm going to talk about a bit later. First is creation techniques, then some tips about surfaces, then how to get the sort of the best performance out of your corridor, the object viewer, etc. Then we're going to talk split roads. Um, really, that's just um, an example of some of the stuff you can talk about um, with corridors. The te technique I'm going to show you for split roads can be uh, employed for lots of other pieces of the corridor. So creation techniques, the first thing I'm going to talk about is baselines. I'm going to switch over to Civil 3D here, and I'll open my baselines file. When corridors were first released by Autodesk, um, you could only create a corridor using alignments and profiles. Over time, people wished that you could use, let's say, grading feature lines to make a corridor, and, and we have that now. It's been around for quite a few releases. You can create a corridor using alignments and profiles, yes, but you can also create a corridor using a corridor feature line. And so this part of the, the webinar really isn't about which one you should use. There's not really any best practice per se. It's really about how you prefer to work. You know, if I'm going to create a road, some linear type object. In my brain, it sort of makes sense to use an alignment and profile because that's typically how civil engineers have worked forever. If I'm creating some kind of nonlinear feature, like um, a detention pond or something, you might not think you would use a, an alignment and profile for a detention pond, but you could, let's say. Here's an example. This one here, that's my typical road, and I've used an alignment and profile. This one is a ditch, and I've chosen to use a feature line. You know, could I have used an alignment and profile for that? Absolutely. But just because I can, I wanted to use a feature line for that instead. So really, it's about you. Are you more comfortable in this particular situation using an alignment and profile, or does it make more sense to use a feature line? What if, what if you want to use a feature line because you're going to be using some grading? Maybe you're not even going to use a corridor at all. And you want the benefits of alignment and profile. Well, this one isn't really about corridors per se. But it's about using alignments, profiles, and feature lines together. Okay, This here is an alignment. You can tell because it's got your typical station labels. Um, by the way, I think Saeed mentioned it, and I'll mention it again. If you have a question, um, there is a questions panel in your GoToWebinar tab. Uh, feel free to ask the question there, and we're going to address the questions every 20 minutes or so. All right, back to the regularly scheduled program. My alignment, complete with its design profile because this is a berm, let's call it, with a spillway in the middle. And for me, I, I would like to use grading tools for my berm, but because I like, I prefer to edit my verticality using profiles, it makes more sense to me to edit this in a profile as opposed to a feature line. I can do it a lot faster. It's, it's easier for me to adhere to, you know, like a 10% grade here, and a 25% grade for the spillway. It's easier for me to do that with a profile. So alignment and profile makes sense, but I want to grade from this thing. No problem. Right now it's not a feature line, but I can certainly make a feature line using this tool. I'll just really quickly go through it. Because it's a feature line, you have a choice whether or not it goes on a site. I've chosen an alignment and, and to get the elevation data, I can choose one of the two profiles I have. That's my design profile right there. And the feature line style, and what layer it goes on, tessellation factor, if there happens to be curves, and then this magic button. 
the feature line that gets extracted from this alignment and profile combination will be a dynamic feature line. Feel free to grade all you like, but the moment you change that alignment and its associated profile, that feature line will update, and therefore your grading will update as well. So not corridors, but it's sort of along the same line. So this part, again, really isn't best practice per se. It's, it's about how you feel about it. You can use alignments and profiles, or you can use feature lines. It's up to you, which, which makes the most sense. Now, here's a situation where I'm designing a detention pond using a corridor. I've decided it makes sense for me to use a corridor. And because it's a detention pond, it's a closed loop. I'll open that file. And this is fine. You know, feel free to create your detention pond with a corridor. Um, understand that detention ponds often have corners with no radii, and so you're going to be susceptible to those nasty bow ties. By the way, I'll talk about those later as well. But if you've got a handle on how to deal with your bow ties and you still want to use an alignment profile feature line, let's say, you want to make a corridor for your detention pond, heed this advice. I've got one detention pond there, and then over here, it's not a detention pond yet, but it's ready to become one. It's important where you start your alignment. So with this alignment, the green line that you see, I just drew an AutoCAD rectangle, and I defined an alignment from it. And when that happens, rectangles always begin at one corner. And you know, if you're just doing a normal feature line or grading or alignment, starting it there, it's not a problem. But because I need to make a corridor from this closed loop, and I'm going to rely on the automatic bow tie resolution, or even not just the automatic bow tie resolution, but the manual bow tie resolution, here's what happens at the corners. Okay, that's perfect. That's the automatic bow tie resolution in action. Normally, you know, three, four years ago, we would have had a bow tie and we would have been very upset about how the corridor handles those things. And, you know, now we've got something a little better. There's another good one. This corner, there's another good one. And then finally, uh-oh, that's our start point. Right, because we started at the corner, Civil 3D has no ability to clean up this particular bow tie. Even if you try to do it manually, it's not really going to work. So if you're going to have this kind of closed loop corridor, and it doesn't have to be a detention pond, right? It can be a loop road um, in a subdivision, let's say. It's important that you start the alignment, station zero, somewhere along one of these straight stretches along in the middle of a tangent. It doesn't have to be the middle of a tangent, but somewhere along that tangent. So here's my example here. There's my detention pond and station zero. And station 375 are at the same spot. Okay, starts here, goes clockwise, and it finishes at station 375 exactly on that same spot. So if you want to do a closed loop, the, the magic bullet for this one is you need to start your alignment in the middle of one of your tangents. Okay, assemblies. It's tough to say exact best practices of assemblies here. I can't tell you which assemblies you have to use. You sort of have to figure that one out on your own, but there's things that you can do that are going to give you grief. All right, let me open up my assemblies file. Um, I teach a lot of civil 3D, and when we talk about corridors, by the way, 
if I had to pick a feature in Civil 3D that I don't know I'm, I'm the best at, not I'm I'm not saying I'm the best that I feel is is my strong point. Um, I, I like all of Civil 3D, but I think corridors are probably my favorite part of it. And so I I teach a lot of corridors and we do advanced classes. And there's one thing that I always show my students um, when you think you're finished making your assembly. So here I've got it, your typical road, I think I'm done. So I'll go to this guy and, and when I think I'm finished, all right, I, I don't think there's anything else for me to do. I'll always go into the assembly properties and look at the construction tab. What I'm looking for is for this to make sense. All right, look at my assembly. I have one, two, three sub assemblies on the left, one, two, three on the right. This jives with that. On the left, I've got three things. On the right, I have three things. Okay, that one's good. What about this one? Mm -hmm. The left seems okay, but the right, there's only one lane. Why did that happen? It looks fine. Well, as you know, looks are deceiving. You can get into this situation by using the AutoCAD copy command to copy things. Right, here's what I mean. I can use AutoCAD copy to copy this subassembly from that point to, I'm just going to put it here. There. Okay. So I AutoCAD copied that thing. And yes, obviously it doesn't look in place right now. But when I go to the assembly properties, still in the construction tab, that thing hasn't been added. So that's the most common way to get yourself into this problem. You've, you've AutoCAD copied something and it looks okay, but it's not actually attached to the subassembly. It appears that it is, but it isn't really. Now, to fix this, this is called a, a detached subassembly, by the way. When I right click that curb, I have this option add to assembly. That means this curb is not attached to any subassembly. So I'll right-click it and I'll choose Add to Assembly and then I'll choose the appropriate marker point to add it to. And that'll be the end of my lane there. Now it didn't look any different, but let's take a look in the Assembly Properties. It's Construction tab. Aha, there it is. All right, it's now actually part of the assembly. So when you're rebuilding your corridor and you realize there's a curb missing or there's something missing, take a look here in the construction tab. I'm going to finish it off by adding this daylight. Add to assembly. I'll choose my curb. Again, it doesn't look any different, but have a look at the assembly properties and construction tab. There it is. It's all good. So that's tip number one. When you're managing your assemblies, the last thing you do before you build your corridor is go into Assembly Properties Construction tab just to make everything seem like it's going okay. Um, one other common thing you, that can happen is, is you can have two lanes on the same side. You know, especially when you're new to Civil 3D, you're clicking away and, and nothing's happening, but in, in reality, every time you click, you're adding a new lane. Uh, I've seen that happen before. So when you have, let's say, multiple sub-assemblies here, you got to get rid of one of them. By the way, you can right-click and you can delete sub-assemblies from here because sometimes it's difficult to pick. Now, tip number two is about marked points. I have a sub-assembly here. This sub-assembly is called link between two points. And it requires the use of a marked point. In fact, I'll show it to you. Assembly properties, construction, okay, link, slope between points, that's the link, and there's the marked point that it links to. So far, so good. Not going to go into details about that particular subassembly, but 
here's our corridor. Now I'm just going to go ahead and set the targets because this subassembly needs some targets. <clears throat> All right, targets are set. Let's try a rebuild. And I'm going to go into region properties and have a look. I'm going to quickly switch to a different subassembly and then back just so you can see what happens. All right, switched assemblies. Let's just switch it back. So I want you to be able to see there's going to be an error that happens. There it is. So first of all, target object not found. And then we get into these errors. If you've ever used a marked point, you've probably seen this error. You may not have, but I'll show you why you've seen it. So it says no marked point found, when clearly it's part of my subassembly. I'm going to go back into Assembly Properties, Construction tab. There's the link to Mark Point. There's the Mark Point. It's there. Why doesn't this uh, software find it? The reason the corridor can't find it is because of the order. That Mark Point must be above the link to it. Because this is how the corridor works. When the corridor is built, in this case, it's going to process from top down. It's going to process the left side. It's going to process the, the lane, the gutter, the daylight. Then it goes to the right side. It processes these. And then when it gets to here, it's trying to process that. It's looking for the mark point, but it hasn't had a chance to process it yet. Hence the error. So how do we get that mark point above the link to it? We click the group that it's in, and we choose to move it up. Now that group is above this group, therefore the mark point is above the link to it. Now when I rebuild the corridor, it's all gonna be good because the mark point gets defined or processed before the link to it. Rebuild. There we are, no errors. By the way, just so you can understand what this Subassembly does. I'll quickly go into the section editor. Link between two points. It starts here. It slopes at a slope in one direction, and it slopes from the marked point in a different direction. And I've chosen to give it a one meter top. So in this case, I've chosen to, to create a berm. You could make the slopes negative, and then you get a ditch. So that's how that subassembly works. So moral of that story, make sure the mark points are defined prior to the links to them, simply by changing the order. All right, Jay, if you are there, unmute yourself and let's let's review any questions that we have so far. I'm here. Uh, we haven't had any questions related to corridors yet. So Okay, very I'll good. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing happened last week, and then all hell broke loose a little bit later. So we'll see what happens in a few minutes. Thanks, Jake. Yep, no problem. Um, a couple more things with assemblies before I move on. I mentioned you shouldn't AutoCAD copy those things, and, and I stand by that. You might think, well, how do I copy from one assembly to another, let's say? You know, I want to. I want to copy this curb to the other side of the road. Don't use the copy. It's all about right click. See, these sub assemblies must be attached to other sub assemblies. That's why the software always asks you to select the appropriate marker when you're adding sub assemblies. It's these three tools right down here copy to, move to, and mirror. So, copy to, then we choose the appropriate marker. It is clearly that's not what I wanted to do, but that's how you copy a subassembly. If I wanted to move it, it's the same thing. For example, maybe this daylight I don't want it there. I want that daylight to be down here for some reason. Oops. And so 
don't use the AutoCAD move and don't use the grip. What happens when you use the grip edit? It, it looks like it works and guess what? It, it probably will, but you've just introduced an offset. By manually moving a subassembly, you've created a subassembly offset. How do I know? When I right click it, I see something that says clear offset in assembly. That tells me that I've manually moved it. Now, sometimes you have to do that in various situations, but not usually. So if you have an offset, I need to clear it first. Then if I actually need to move it, I need to right click, move to, then choose the appropriate marker. Obviously I don't want that, so I'm gonna undo. Undid one too many. Now the other one is mirror. And so in AutoCAD, if I was to use the AutoCAD mirror command, see, I'm, I'm going to pick here. But if I use AutoCAD mirror, what's going to happen? What you'd think should happen is if that red line, vertical line, is my mirror point, we've got a gap between here. That's how AutoCAD mirror works. But the Civil 3D subassembly mirror is different. Oh, so I have a mouse problem. There we go. Uh, it's different because these subassemblies must be attached to other subassemblies. When I use the mirror tool by right clicking and then choosing the appropriate marker, the subassemblies, yes, indeed, will be mirrored, but they must be attached. So they attach at the point where I pick and that they mirror about that point. So right click, copy to, move, and mirror. Those are the only tools you need to use for those three things with subassemblies. Corridor anomalies, the two most common things are waterfalls and bow ties. All right, I'm gonna open up those drawings. Let me close these first, don't need to have so many drawings open. Come on, anytime. So the top image is a bow tie. It happens when typically when you have a corridor that has a change in direction but no curve. There, I've got a, a corner in the corridor, no curve. Um, the corridor ends up crossing itself, as you can see. So bow ties have been around since corridors have been around. And we've only really been able, been able to fix them starting in 2017, right? There's our corner right there. Now, if we had a little radius there, that would have helped out a lot. But if the radius is too small, we're still going to get a little bit of a bow tie. So to fix this, really, I, I want a big radius. But, but what if you can't have a radius? What if it's a tailings pond and you're not allowed to put a radius there? Well, if we're going to have a bow tie, and we have to learn how to fix it. Um, the bottom image, that's what a waterfall looks like in plan view. Waterfalls are a little more easily seen. Uh, with the object viewer. There, that's what a waterfall looks like in three dimension. And everything's going along great here, and then all of a sudden, yeah, right down to elevation zero. Same thing on the other side. So a lot of the corridor is fine, but the beginning and the end seem to jump all the way down to elevation zero for some reason. This is probably the most common problem you're going to run into with corridors. And it happens for one of two reasons. The first reason is you as the designer made a mistake designing the profile. Okay, the blue profile here, the cyan profile, that is my design profile. And what I'm looking for 
is this right here. That is station zero right there. The alignment starts at station zero. The corridor starts at station zero. But guess what? My design profile doesn't start until station 0 0.7. So what elevation do you think the corridor uses between here and here if there's no design elevation? Well, zero. That's why we have a problem. In this case, it was my fault. So if I were to actually edit this and move it to the right spot, and rebuild the corridor, at station zero, there is a valid elevation. And so I won't get a waterfall on that end. On the other end, I don't actually want my profile to end here. In this case, my alignment is 300 meters long, or actually, what is it? 360, 370 meters long, roughly. But I don't want my corridor to go all the way to the end of the alignment. I want to stop my corridor before the alignment ends. So this profile is, in fact, drawn correctly. It stops at station 340 because I want my road to stop at station 340. Problem is, when you first create your corridor, it's going to be the same length as your alignment. It's going to go from 0 to 370. I need to tell the corridor to stop early. I would like you to stop at station 340. All right. Corridor properties. Parameters tab. I've got one region. It starts at zero and it finishes at the alignment finish. I would like to change the end station to 340. Rebuild. No more bow ties. I fixed the error in the beginning. And I change the end station of that of that corridor. So that's how waterfalls happen. You either make a mistake designing your design profile, or you need to stop your corridor before the alignment stops. Our friend bow ties. This bow tie has actually been fixed, as has that one, as has this one, even though I've got an error there. That's not an error. That's a warning. It's a tangency warning. Right? I've got a, a tangent and a curve that aren't tangent to each other. No problem. That's what I wanted. It's just telling me. So in this case, the bow tie has actually been fixed <clears throat> um, automatically. POW. Okay, this feature actually came out in Civil 3D 2017. And it's a feature that you actually have to turn on. Clearly, I have the feature turned on. Um, if you have a Civil 3D template that you've been pulling forward for many years, um, it's possible that this feature has actually been turned off for you. So I recommend go back to your office, have a look at your template, and make sure that this feature is turned on automatic fixing of the bow ties. And where is that feature? Well, it's going to be in my tool space. It's going to be in my settings tab. So find my corridor collection and I'll go to the feature settings for corridors. Automatic clear bow tie options. There they are. There's two options. Do you want to fix tangent tangent intersections? Yes. Do you want to fix tangent arc, arc tangent? Yeah, well, why not? I'm going to set them both to yes. So set those both to yes, then go ahead and make your corridors. And if it can fix bow ties automatically, it will. But what about that if I just said, why does it fix some and not others? Okay, This corridor does not change width. The assembly is two generic links. Right, there's my center line. There's a generic link that goes this way. There's one that goes that way. They're, I don't know, two meters wide, let's say. And they never change width. I haven't applied any targeting. You know, if this was a road, I might have a bus bay or something. Well, that's the corridor changing width. And the second you start changing the width, the automatic bow ties do not fix. 
So if you have a corridor that never changes width, you can use this feature. Um, it's fairly rare though, because you know a lot of times we have these daylight lines, and that's the corridor changing width. So guess what? You're not going to be able to use automatic in that case. But what if we have a corridor that, that does change width and, and, and we still get bow ties? So quickly, I'm going to change to a different subassembly here. Okay, this one, because we have daylight, it does change width, and therefore we've got a problem with bow ties. How do we fix it? And, you know, before I say how, you might want to say, well, why do we want to fix it? Um, maybe you're okay with this. It doesn't look very good, but maybe you have, you know, dummy line work that, that you've trimmed and extended, and, and your actual dummy line work that you print looks good. Does it matter if the corridor is sort of screwed up? Is it affecting our volumes? Not too much, really. But guess what? If you want to make a corridor surface from this and you want to use the automatic outer boundary option for corridors, because the corridor crosses itself, that boundary is going to result in an invalid boundary and the boundary will not work. So you need to fix the bow ties, if, especially if you want to make a surface. Clear corridor bow ties is the tool. We need to pick the starting sub entity, which is essentially the piece of the alignment that's coming into the corner, then the piece of the alignment that's going that's going out of the corner, and then we have to pick an intersection point. It's easier for me to show you what's going to happen. I'm going to pick the intersection between those two daylight lines, and it says, "Do I want to specify another bow tie?" Yeah, sure. I know there's another one over here, so I'll just in the middle of this command, I'll come over here, fix this one. I didn't pick the alignment. There it is. Intersection point, and I'll just leave it at that. That's how the software fixes the bow ties. That intersection point that you pick, all of these corridor links generate to that one spot. Same thing over here. So it fixes the inside of our corridor very nicely. The outside, well, it's not my favorite. It doesn't really do anything to the outside because guess what? The corridor is not crossing itself. So there's no actual bow tie problem. <clears throat> For me, I wish it would do that. But that's going to be on the wish list item for later, I suppose. We don't do that yet. But at least the corridor doesn't cross itself now, and I can generate a surface without an error. Now, I think what I'm going to do is pop up a little poll for you. You're gonna see in a minute a couple questions that pop up on your screen. And now, of course, I completely forgot to do the first poll, so I'm gonna do two polls in a row here. So the first poll I'm gonna launch right now, and all you have to do is click yes or no. Question is, do you sometimes use feature lines as corridor baselines? I'm curious how many people use feature lines uh, for corridor baselines. All right, there it is. Everybody already answered. Thank you very much. I will share the poll. I'll close it. I'll share it. And here it is. So really, it's, it's pretty close to half and half. Now, I didn't ask how often do you do it, but I just wanted to know how many people actually use feature lines sometimes as corridor baselines. This is more than I expected. So thank you very much. Okay, I'll hide that one. I'll pop up another poll. This one is interesting. So think about it for a second. I'm going to launch the poll. You'll see the question. All right, the question is, if you've used the clear bow ties tool, 
how successful are you with it? Is it six, zero to 20 means it's not really successful very much. 80 to 100, it's successful almost all the time. So think about that for a minute. I'm curious, what kind of success rate you have with clear bow ties? <clears throat> Okay, we've got 24 people, 24% of you have voted so far, so I'll give you another minute or so. So when you've used the bow tie tool, how successful is it? Now, I'm not expecting 100% of you to vote because probably not 100% of you have used the bow ties tool. Okay, it's a race. There's a lot of you, uh, 36% of the people who voted, voted zero to 20%. That's a little bit surprising to me. Now, did it work? Success, you know, define success, I suppose. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and I'll pop it up for you. All right, there's the success rate so far. 35% are in the zero to 20, then it's, it gets less as it goes up. 10% are seemingly, you know, good. Um, if you're having trouble with the bow tie tool, there, there, there could be varying levels of success, I suppose. I would highly encourage you to contact um, us if you're having trouble with the bow tie tool. Number one, it's possible that there's a technique that we can show you that that could make it work for you. It's also possible that well, it's just not doing a very good job. You know, when I was doing some beta testing for this particular feature a bunch of years ago when it first came out, uh, there were a lot of things wrong with it. And every time we discovered something wrong, we would submit it to the developers and they'd look at it and say, oh, this is a whole different sort of scenario. And, and the more actual real life examples Autodesk can get their hands on where this doesn't work, the better it's gonna work for us. So I'd highly recommend either, at the very least, create an Autodesk case yourself directly with Autodesk, or better yet, you know, contact us and maybe we can work through it with you. Okay, thank you very much. I'll close that poll and we shall move on. Oops. Surfaces. You can add corridor features like feature lines or links to a surface. And once you've got a surface, sometimes you have a, a bad surface. So I'm going to start opening my drawing and I'll flip back to that screen in just a second. Have a look at this image. Look at the triangulation. Specifically, this is supposed to be a curb, right? This is what a curb looks like. You've never seen curb before. I know you have. That's what a curb looks like. The triangulation, I can see that there's a triangle going from the top of curb all the way down to the edge of pavement. That's bad triangulation. It happens. A lot of the time when you build a corridor, the triangulation is just right. But there are certain circumstances that cause bad triangulation. And by the way, you can see it over on the right side here too. The green, the purple, and the blue lines of the corridor, they're being crossed all over the place by my triangulation. And so if this was you making a surface from survey, basically you've forgotten to add brake lines. If this wasn't a corridor, the tool you would use is brake lines. Because this is a corridor, we have to do a little bit more, okay? Most users, when they're making a, a surface from a corridor, they use what's called top links. And almost always that's good enough. Where's my bus bay? There it is. <clears throat> All right, here's my problem. Bad triangulation. Okay, when you're building a corridor, surface that is, I'm going to forget about the datum for a second and have a look at the top. Most people use simply just top links. There it is right there as part of the corridor, and that works fine, and that's great. 
But when you create this type of bus bay, and this happens to me almost every time I do this kind of bus bay, I have my lane that's widening to accommodate a bus bay or a passing lane, and then it comes back again. This type of bad triangulation happens almost every time for me, but it's easy to fix. You can't just use top links. You have to now start using feature lines. But which ones? We have lots of feature lines to choose from. It's, it's the feature lines in the vicinity of the curb. So flow line gutter is one. That's, let me just draw this. Okay, flow line gutter is that point right there. Top of curb is this. Back of curb is that. I need to add at least those three. And, and at the same time, I'm going to add this. That's the ETW. This is just like adding brake lines to a regular surface. I'll add back a curb. ETW. I may not need that one, but I'm going to add it anyways. Is there a problem with adding too many of these things? No, not really. You could add them all if you wanted to. Well, I wouldn't recommend adding them all because we definitely don't want to do these ones because those are underground. So what do I have? Top, back curb, ETW, flow line gutter, top curb. That is fine, I think. I'll hit OK. It's going to rebuild. And let's take a look at our triangulation. Oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. So if you spent a lot of time using you know, the, the flip face or the, the swap edge tool for your surfaces from corridors, you've been spending too much time. Add those feature lines in that manner, and that'll probably get you all the way. It's very likely that your surface will be perfect after that, and you won't have to change anything. All right, so that's adding links and feature lines. What about this overhang correction thing? By the way, I highly recommend adding your surfaces to a sample line group or even just doing a quick section or quick profile through your corridor and just have a look at your surfaces to make sure they look good. Because guess what? That one doesn't look good. That's terrible. Comes down here, goes up to the back of curb there, comes back down again. This is a datum surface. It's supposed to follow the bottom of the corridor. This is for volumes. This is perfect. That's what I want to see. Goes down, follows the bottom of the corridor. I can calculate volumetrics this way. But why does this happen? I'm going to do a really quick explanation of why it happens, but the fix is actually super simple. Okay, here's why it happens. I need to go over to my assembly. Um, when you create a datum surface from your corridor, you're typically using the datum links. There's a datum link at the bottom of every subassembly. That datum link is defined from the crown to here. The curb datum link is defined from here to here. And the datum, sorry, the daylight datum link is defined from here to the daylight. You'll notice that they overlap a little bit right here. Okay, the curb datum overlaps with the daylight datum. That's exactly what causes this funky surface anomaly, usually with datum surfaces. It's these overlapping datum links. That's your basic explanation. Um, before we had the tool to fix it, it was really quite a pain in the butt to fix this. I had to go jump through a bunch of hoops. Now we've got one little setting. Corridor surfaces, datum, right here, overhang correction, bottom links. I'm going to go out and say it. Do this every single time you make a datum surface, every time. There's, I can't think right now off the top of my head, and I've been doing this for many years, I can't think of any time where this has been a bad idea. So just do it. You're making datum surfaces, 
Just make it a matter of course. Set the overhang correction to bottom links. Guess what? While you're at it, when you're making top surfaces, set it to top links. It's less common, but you can have overlapping top links in your corridor. It's very rare that I've encountered that, but it can happen. So set your top surfaces to top links, set your bottom surfaces to bottom links. Every time. Um, there, I said it. Surface boundaries. Every surface needs a boundary. Why? Well, I like to teach it this way. When you're making surfaces, there's two types of corners. There's an outside corner or exterior corner. That's an outside corner. That's an outside corner. That's an outside, but that is an inside corner. When you have inside corners, Civil 3D always triangulates outside that corner, not where you want it to be. That's typically why we need an outer boundary. Corridors have the option to create an outer boundary extremely easily. After you build your corridor surface, use the corridor extents. Wherever the corridor ends, we want to use that as the boundary. That suits probably 90% of people. There's other options though. Add from polygon, basically, you draw a polyline and you can use that as your surface boundary, uh, not unlike a normal surface boundary. Add interactively. Interesting there. Yeah, you may not have used that. That is using your corridor's feature lines as boundaries. You pick one and it sort of follows your mouse around. I'm not going to demonstrate that one. And then lastly, add automatically. You may or may not have seen this one. Um, sometimes you get very few options here and sometimes you get lots of options. Um, add automatically works in one scenario when you have exactly two feature lines of the same name. So for example, there is my center of the corridor, crown. There's only one crown feature line, so you would almost never get the option to add a, a crown as an automatic. But we very often have two ETW, edge of travel way, feature lines. Because we have exactly two, one on the left, one on the right, it's going to show up as an option for add automatically. See, maybe you want your corridor surface to stop at the edge of road. You don't want it to go all the way to the daylight. You don't want to use the corridor extents. You want to stop your surface at the edge of the road. So you can use the ETW feature lines as automatic boundaries or the back of curb or the back of sidewalk but what if you have this scenario? You have an edge of travel way, but you only have sidewalk on one side, right? There's my sidewalk. There's no sidewalk on the left side. Well, because you only have one back of sidewalk feature line, you are not going to get back of or, yeah, you're not going to get back of sidewalk as an option. You must have exactly two feature lines of the same name. Sidewalk on one side, sidewalk on the other. You can't have three. You can't have one. It has to be exactly two. When might you get three feature lines of the same name? If you've used generic links, generic links always have a point code of P2. So your corridor is going to have all these feature lines, if you've used generic links, whose name is P2. You've got four on the left, sorry, four on the right, two on the left, well, there's six feature lines whose name is P2. I have six. I have to have two. Now, luckily, with corridors, with assemblies, you can actually rename your generic links so that you have exactly two. So, if you want to go too much more detail with that, if you're interested, again, call us up. We are definitely happy to do a short training session on how to sort of make this happen for you. All right, just before we get into performance, I'm going to call on Jay again. Mr. Kwan, do we have any other questions? 
Yeah, we have a few questions now. Uh, the first question is from Lei, and um, the question is, how do you define the start point of alignment created from a rectangle? Were you able to answer that one? Um, I said that I just tend to draw a rectangle as a closed polyline to control yep. the start point. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it depends on how you want to create the alignment. Um, if you've drawn a rectangle with the rectangle command, you have this, and it's going to start there. So before you turn that polyline into an alignment, you just need to edit it in some way and probably just break it here and then join it, and now we have a start point. Um, but if you're, if you're using the alignment creation layout tools, don't start at a corner. Just start here, go 100 meters this way, 200, 200, 200, and then 100 again. So it depends on how you want to do it. If you're going to create your alignment with the alignment tools, it's easy because you just start here. But if you've already drawn that rectangle, I would recommend maybe breaking it right here and then connecting them up so that you have a vertex there. And one of those is going to be your start point. Okay, next question. Okay, question two is from Stuart. Outside bow tie, can you have an outer curve versus tangent? I'm not sure I understand that one. What did you say? Um, I kind of uh, put you under the bus. <laughs> because oh, okay. I didn't quite understand it either. Um, because typically you don't have a bow tie on the outside, right? No, you, you bow ties always happen on the inside. I'd be curious to see what could happen on the outside. So uh, who was that? What was his name again? That, that was uh, Stuart Radloff. So maybe it's something we can kind of follow up a little bit. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Certainly. Uh, get, I'm going to show my email address at the end of this, and so feel free to email us uh, after, and and we'll uh, we'll address that question further. Any others? Uh, yep. Next one is from Caitlin, and uh, the question is, how do you know where to choose the intersection point for the bow tie fix? And your answer was? I answered typically the outermost intersecting point of the corridor sections um, uh, where it's giving you trouble or slightly further out? Yeah, I know it's pretty hard to ans answer that question with, with text, right? Yeah. So in, uh, in my case here, that's the intersection point. Usually the, yeah, like, like Jay said, the outermost feature lines, like that's my daylight line here and that's my daylight line here. The outermost feature lines where those two intersect that's almost always your uh, your intersection point. All right, good question. Yeah, it was. And uh, the next question is from Chad. Um, did you have to create the feature lines, or were they automatically created for the curb, ETW, flow line, etc.? And um, I answered that they are auto corridor feature lines that are generated by the assembly co like point codes. Mm -hmm. um, connecting together. That might have been a little bit too much jargon put together, so I'm not sure. Maybe visually <laughs> you can explain better than I can. Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. So the answer to the question is they're created automatically, right? When you make a corridor, all these lines that are sort of roughly parallel to your alignment, those are called feature lines. Those just happen. There's nothing you need to do with those. Um, and they all have names, by the way. When I hover on this guy right here, it says that's ETW. Hover on this one, that says that's flow line gutter. That's back a curb. So all those things have names. And those names and those feature lines come from your subassembly. Okay, here's a curb. All these little circles, the markers, those have names, right? That's our flow line gutter. That's our top curb, that's our back curb. This one I'm circling, that's the ETW, or edge of travel way. And so the feature lines come from these codes that are built into each and every subassembly. And so when you make your corridor, it connects up all of the flow line gutters together. And it connects up all the ETWs together. That's where the feature lines come from. Nice. 
All right. Um, if there's more questions, great. I'm going to move on. Jay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm pretty much going to finish up and then Saeed is going to come back and he's going to do his thing. And we'll, we'll take the last set of questions um, at the end, probably 20 after, 25 after or so. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, you're welcome. So my last poll question of today's seminar. For those of you who have used the object viewer with the corridor, are you happy with the performance? Or does it seem like the corridor is like this pig when you look in the object viewer? What do you think? Uh, as expected. Oh, no. Wow. It's not expected. All right, everybody's answered already. Thank you. That's so you guys are so fast. How many people are there? There's 105 people here. By the way, thanks for attending. That's a, that's a really good number. I'm really impressed with uh, with your attendance. Thanks. So I'm going to close this poll and I'll show it to you. This is actually not what I expected. I was expecting a lot more yeses because I get a lot of complaints. The corridor in the object viewer is just slow as heck. Holy crap, it's I can't even hardly use it. But we're 50-50 here, pretty much. But I'm still going to show you what happens. All right, here's why the corridor is slow in the object viewer. This corridor is fairly intense. Now, guess what? If you have a small corridor and you haven't set your frequency very dense, you're probably not going to have performance issues. But if you have a really dense corridor, you probably will have performance issues in the object viewer. Here's why. It's all about how many objects we're asking it to orbit. Let me open up my performance drawing while that's opening. All right, let's count. These assemblies are made of three things, points, lengths, and shapes. Wherever you see a circle. Hey, Matt, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Matt. Sorry to interrupt you, but we're still looking at the poll. If you can swap. Oh, crap. Your... I'm sorry. Thank you. It's okay. There. Is that better? Much better. Bye, Thanks. Everybody. All right. <laughs> great. So points, links, and shapes. Um, every subassembly has these points, links, and shapes. I'm going to zoom into my curb here so we can figure out what that means. The points, aka markers, are all the little circles that you see. How many circles do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine circles. That's just for the curb. There's two more for the daylights, 10, 11. And there's five on this side of the lane, that's 16. And there's five more circles on the other side of the lane, that's 21, so 21 circles. Then how many links do we have? One, two, three, four, five links there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's 15, 16. Anyways, I'm not going to continue counting. There's a lot of links. And then the shapes are these enclosed areas. Those are called shapes. And there's a bunch of shapes too. And guess what? I've only done one half. So maybe there's 40 objects on this side. And there's 40 more objects on the other side. So every corridor section, we're asking it to display 80 to 100 different things. And when your corridor is really intense, 80 or 100 objects times how many sections we have, you're asking the corridor to do a lot of work. So how do we fix it? How do we make it better? Well, instead of showing all these things, I'm going to tell the corridor to show only the links, but not even just all links, only the top links. And I'm not going to show you how to do this because in the interest of time, I've created something called a code set style. Code set styles show cross sections. And so I have one called top only that I've made. It only displays the top links. It doesn't look any different in plan, which is great because I don't want my corridor to look different. But in the object viewer, this is a pretty intense corridor. It's pretty big. And it orbits 
very quickly. If you've had a corridor this size before, you probably know that it really doesn't orbit very well at all. And mine's orbiting with no lag whatsoever. And guess what? I don't even have a really great computer. It's, it's good, but it's certainly not top notch. So it's all about the code set style. You need to make sure it shows only top links for your corridor. I recommend that you set that as your default code set style for corridors. So when you make a corridor, top links just happen. So that's the object viewer. But there's other performance considerations, such as assembly frequency. You know, I get asked the question a lot, which, what should my corridor frequency be? If you don't know what frequency is, it's all these little corridor sections that happen. And my answer to that question is, geez, you know what, it depends. If you're in preliminary design, there's absolutely no reason to have a super dense corridor. You know, in prelim design, I go 100 meters. You know, if if it's only a 200 meter corridor, I'm fine. I'll, I'll go five, three meters. It doesn't really matter because it's it's so small. If I have a 30 kilometer corridor, prelim design, there's almost no reason for me to go really dense. So in the beginning, I'll start 100 meters. Detail design, you know, that's when I start tightening up my corridor frequency. But it doesn't have to be tight for the entire time. You know, really. The important part is right at the end, when I want that final volumetric number, when I want that final top surface or datum surface, I wait till the very end to set the density to something really tight, five meters, 10 meters, whatever it is. Yeah, sure, I'm gonna take a hit. I'm gonna wait the five minutes or the, the two minutes for the corridor to rebuild. But if I wait till the very end, I'm not having to rebuild it for five minutes every single time. So. Your choice in assembly frequency depends on where you are in your design cycle. Um, also regions. I don't have to have the same frequency for the entire corridor. I've got some funky daylighting going on here. I, I need my corridor to be a lot more dense in this area. So I'm gonna split this region into, well, multiple regions. <clears throat> okay, my computer is doing something interesting. I'm trying to split it and it's not happy right now, but give me one say, oh yeah, okay, it did split it. I'll split it again. Is what I want to do is I want to set the frequency to two meters or something really tight, but just here. You know, west of that, I want to keep the frequency the same. East of that, I want to keep it the same, but right here. So I can split the corridor up into multiple regions so that I can affect the frequency on a just a smaller basis here. I think I'm getting this performance issue because my O snap is turned on there. That works better. So I now have a brand new region right here. And so I'm going to set the frequency, but just for that one region. Right now it's at 10. I'm going to make it 2. So your frequency, you don't have to set the same frequency for the entire corridor. You can have bits of it, different regions at different frequencies. What if you have a long corridor, like 150 kilometers, huge? Um, well, what you can do is you can just split your corridor up into multiple regions and you can turn the regions off. You can isolate regions, you can hide other regions. For a long corridor, you know, you may not need to cut your corridor into regions for the typical reason. Usually people cut corridors into regions for different assemblies. But if it's a long corridor, 150 or even 30 kilometers, maybe you're only designing it two kilometers at a time. I don't need to see all the corridor all the time. What I can do is, oops, ah, shoot. 
Well, that's hitting the wrong button. Let's try again. What I can do is isolate, I switch drawings, interesting. What I can do is isolate a region. Here we go. Corridor, the magic ribbon I want to isolate. This region right here. So for the two kilometers or the five kilometers that you're currently working on, I just don't need to see the rest of the corridor. I can isolate this. It's gonna perform way better in the object viewer. It's gonna rebuild faster. I can show all the regions. Right? They all come back. It's gonna take a second to rebuild. And then I can use the other options. Maybe I wanna hide a region or even delete a region. So use regions to help you with performance. Isolate, hide, show, delete. All of it's gonna help. Uh, and then lastly, multiple drawings. You know, I don't, I don't wanna have to get to this level, but guess what? If you're doing a long highway, 150 kilometers, you are going to be hard pressed to design the entire corridor in one DWG file. Sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and that's 150 kilometers. And so maybe 50 kilometer DWG files, right? Every drawing has its own little piece of the highway. The first 50K, 150 kilometers, 200 kilometers, et cetera. You're gonna have one alignment and one profile for all 150 kilometers. But because of performance issues, sometimes you need to split up your drawings into maybe 20 kilometer sections. So make liberal use of data shortcuts, data references, data referencing your corridors, making top surfaces and datum surfaces, liberal use of data shortcuts in that case. Okay, finally, let's talk about the split road. Now I chose split road But you can use the same technique for an intersection design or highway on ramps and off ramps. There's a couple of pieces in here that, that um, tips and tricks that you sort of need to use. Um, all right, here's what a split road is in, uh, in my opinion. Right, I've got one road with one eastbound lane and one westbound lane. And so this lane, we've got this big rock formation and there's not enough room on either side to pull the whole road through. So one lane has to go around this side and the other lane has to go around that side. That's what I call a split road. So a couple things. What do we do with the alignments? In my case, I have two alignments. One's blue and one's red. This is my main alignment. That goes from zero to the end. The secondary alignment is, is just for the one lane that goes around that rock formation, and that's it. That's where that alignment ends. How do I create that alignment? You'll notice that they overlap a little bit on either end. Some users would say, well, I'll, they don't need to overlap, so I'll just start the alignment exactly right here, exactly where this, where they diverge. Don't do that. It's gonna help you later when you're creating your profile. It's a great idea to overlap them a little bit. How much? Doesn't really matter. 10, 20 meters, that's fine. See, the piece of the corridor, I'm not gonna have a corridor that, that starts here for, the, for this piece. It's gonna start where they diverge but it's nice to have the alignments overlap for profiling reasons. So definitely make them overlap. What about that profile? Because that's always the hard part, right? This alignment, the blue Main Street alignment, it's got a design profile and, and it works. But then this red alignment where the two diverge, this point right here where the two alignments diverge, I need to match 
the red profile exactly with the blue profile because that's the crown of my road they have to match perfectly that's historically been dif difficult unless you follow my advice so number one build this part of the corridor first don't even think about designing the profile for this red piece until you've built this piece of the corridor then make a corridor top surface for that so my blue alignment is complete with the corridor and its top surface then i go ahead and create the red alignment with the this is the profile the existing ground profile for the red alignment i then sample the corridor top surface in this profile view it's shown as this sort of magenta line right here. That's my corridor top surface of the other corridor. These magenta vertical lines indicate where my alignment changes direction. By the way, that's done as part of your profile view style. It's, it's a grid component. It's called grid at horizontal geometry point. So in your plan view alignment where you have a pi or where you have a tangent curve intersection it's showing me that so i know exactly that that's the point i want to start at because i have a pi there and because i've sampled my corridor top surface it makes it very easy for me to design the profile for my red alignment because that's my start point not only that i know because i can see it what my incoming grade is. Then I design the profile all the way over here. And same thing on the other side. There's my outgoing grade, and that's the point exactly that I have to tie into. So for my diverging alignment and profile, I've got points that I can click. This is by far the easiest way to design this type of profile. Build part of the corridor first, create that top surface, and sample that top surface in this profile view. So you have something to click on. You have something to snap to. After that, it's just sort of managing a bunch of different regions and assemblies. Yeah, I've got different numbers of assemblies here. Like what happens, you know, if we're gonna diverge here, you know, what do we do? That's getting into more advanced. And uh, if you're going to do something like this, definitely we can schedule some kind of uh, small training session for this. But the hardest part people have trouble with, in my opinion, the phone calls I typically get are how do I how do I match up those two profiles? How do I deal with my alignments? And so that part, I think, hopefully, I've shown you well. So what do we talk about? We gave you some tips and tricks on some creation techniques. Do you use baselines? Do you use feature lines? Some tricks with surfaces. You know, we've got that overhang correction, surface boundaries. Uh, performance tips. The top only code set style will help you with the object viewer performance. Splitting your corridor up into multiple regions and setting the frequency per region will help you there as well. And then some profiling and alignment tips for a split road. So again, this is being recorded. It's going to be available on YouTube sometime in the near future. And I'm going to pass it on to Saeed again. He's going to do his thing, and we'll uh, Jay and I will address the final questions um, at the end. By the way, um, we'll stick around for a few minutes after time to address the, the, the questions if there are any at the end. So Saeed, it's you. Wow, Matt, that was a fantastic presentation. I, I can't believe, like, I watch a lot of your presentations, but the, you always impress me. Well, ah, cool. Thank uh, you very much, man. <laughs> yeah. So, um, excellent, guys. I hope you have enjoyed uh, Matt's uh, presentation. So, I just want to uh, emphasize about a couple of things for those who miss it at the beginning. So, we're having a lot of people looking for a centric platform in the cloud to collaborate with, with other fellows, other colleagues. People are different locations right now. So 
that's why we, we, we're helping customers with BIM360. This is super straightforward. There's not a lot of things to, to set up. Also, remember about Bluebeam. Bluebeam has 90 day trials. So if you ever thought about trying Bluebeam, why, why, don't, why don't do it now, right? So you can try your, your cool remote meetings with Bluebeam Studios and it's, it's free right now, 90 days. So please go to bluebeam.com and start trying. And our classic services, workflow assessments, we're running a lot of those right now. People are holding back a little bit, just evaluating what they're doing good, what they're doing bad, and just improving, getting ready for for when the, this thing is over. It's going to be over, yes. Okay, fellas, so next week, I hope to see you all at the Piper Pressure Networks. Please go raise it right now. We're over 75% uh, percent of capacity right now. It's limited, so please register. And also on May 6th, a Bluebeam Civil Engineering. This is this is gonna be mind blowing. I think Matt's gonna be with us that day too. So looking forward for, to that. For pipes, yeah, I'll definitely be there. No, and for Bluebeam for Civil. Oh, the Bluebeam, yeah, May 6th, yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, awesome. Uh, final reminder: Thursday, vehicle tracking. We only have two spots available. So if you're thinking about learning a little bit of vehicle tracking, half day session. It's gonna be in the afternoon for those in the Eastern time. And uh, just uh, reach out to me. Uh, we can we can talk about this. We can do something private if you need to. So uh, finally, I'd like to remind you for like most of you know, but we have solid assist. This is complementary technical support. If you have issues with deployment, setting up your home licenses, accessing your out of this account, anything like that, just reach out. It's uh, there's a phone number and an email there, or you can reach out to your rep. Uh, this is totally free, so take advantage of that. Okay, finally, our contacts. So we have our emails, direct numbers in case you want to reach out, you want to have you want to have a further conversation about what we what you guys uh, saw today. There's Matt, Jay, and myself. Uh, so please reach out. So uh, Jay, I think uh, this is the time to address any final questions that we have missed. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so we have a great question from Shannon. Uh, can the points within the corridor be export exported to a CSV? Um, I mentioned the toolbox report manager, the corridor section points reports, mm -hmm. but um, if you can think of anything else. I can. So let me, what am I doing? There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. So points from a corridor to a CSV, I assume they're going to be using these for layout. And so the best way to do that is to select the corridor, find your launch pad. Now, my resolution is such that you can't see the values here. But one of them is called points from corridor. Okay, it's not one of those three. It's down here then. That guy right there. So after you've built your corridor, use this launch pad and choose points from corridor. And you have the choice. You got plenty of choices here. So you can say, you know, I want all the points in the entire corridor or some kind of station range. Um, we can add them to a point group. And then you can choose the feature lines that are generating those points. So if you're, if you're planning on laying out just the crown of the road, uncheck everything except crown. And then that's where you're going to get your points. So I'm just going to do it. I'll do this, I'll uncheck crown, unpick everything. When I hit OK, as long as my styles are set up properly, I should see a bunch of points exactly along the center. There they are. Hopefully that answers your question. Now, now that you have points in your drawing, how do you make a CSV from it? Well, we just go to that particular point group now and export points that'll export to a csv you show you choose the appropriate point file format and the file name hit okay you're going to get points from your recorder obviously they're not going to be dynamic but um it's a pretty quick thing all right good question great um we don't have any more questions no uh, well we have an earlier question that maybe you might want to speak to but okay. um, 
Someone asked earlier, any chance the subassembly composer will be explored and the method for custom codes? And uh, Saeed basically said that uh, we're going to have a, a, a sort of a session on subassembly composer um, by yeah. itself, like a workshop. Totally. But, yeah, for sure. Um, the subassembly sub composer doesn't really fit into the best practice series uh, because not many people use it and it's it's if you use it it's sort of it's you need it and so it's not really necessarily best practice to use subassembly composer so we have that as a separate thing um i'm not sure i think we have a, a half day seminar yes. yes matt uh next week on the 22nd we'll be running a half day workshop for uh strictly on on subassembly composer so if you ever thought about using subassembly composer or if you ever try using self-assembly composer, this is the moment. So it's a half day, you can take care of your, your kids in the morning and then dedicate a couple of hours just to uh, just to work on your skills. This is a very nice model and I think, uh, I think it's gonna be fun. Perfect, thanks Said. Yeah, that's, um, it's it's a good class. Uh, they're gonna talk about points, lengths and shapes because those are really the key. If, if you've never heard of points, lengths and shapes before as part of your sub-assembly, you need to understand those. In order, to, in order to be good at the subassembly composer, you also need to understand the targeting. Um, the sky's the limit with that software. Um, Jay, I am looking at one question in here, and I'm just going to reiterate it only because it's a good question. It's a good answer to another question. So the question earlier was, you know, how, how can you set? We, we were talking about the closed loop, and uh, I said, well, if you make a rectangle, you know, maybe break it. Um, but if you've already created the alignment, right, the the zero zero is already on one of the corners. Yeah. Um, who was it? Uh, Raymond Clark suggested for the rectangular alignment, just simply edit the alignment properties to change the start location of the alignment. You can move zero zero to anywhere you want using that tool. Yeah, that's totally the best answer. So Raymond, you you got a gold star for that one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a good comment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, looking through the other questions, let's see. Intersection, we, and we pretty much addressed the rest of them. So, I, yeah, I just wanted to, to to make a note of Raymond's comment there because he has the right answer. And that's pretty much it. Uh, look at that timing. It's 11:30 exactly. This is perfect, man. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. If you have any questions after this, I'm gonna put up my email address on here. Yeah, let me let me let me put the uh, the final slide. Is. Oh, okay, that sounds good. Said's gonna put up the final slide. It's gonna have email addresses and some of our information. Sorry about this. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yes, and uh, and yeah, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you learned something, and I hope to meet you again for our next session about pipe and pressure uh, pipes and pressure networks. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful week. Whether it's my so moments, well, up in your windows, yes. It looks like you have the questions panel open there because it's covering up the. Uh... Oh, sorry. My bad. Okay, that, that's better. Thanks. All right, we'll leave that screen up um, for the next couple of minutes, but for now we are going to sign off. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody.